Paul told me, um, Anthony, we're going to send you up first because uh, we want to get the boring bit out of the way and then we go on to all the fun and interesting things. Um, so I thought, well, not only do we have to deliver, fun, deliver suds in fun and interesting ways, we also have to deliver the numbers in fun and interesting ways. So there lies the challenge. Uh, <clears throat> talk to many people uh, across the industry, and I can talk quite equally amongst my engineering colleagues about flows and numbers. However, whenever I get to talk to landscape architects and people who maybe don't have the same appreciation of the numbers, you do tend to sense a certain interpretation and uh, a certain glazing over of the eyes. Um, so the way I feel about this is, yes, we can apply models, we can apply equations, we can get figures, but the figures are what they are, and they can be arbitrary, which I'll explain in a bit. Uh, so really, everybody in the design team in this multidisciplinary approach should have an appreciation of what the numbers mean. They don't need to be experts, but they should have that appreciation. In similar ways, the, the engineer should have an appreciation of what the landscape is doing and, and what the biodiversity officer is trying to achieve. So it's that wider appreciation. So it's, it's trying to get information in a format that can be benchmarked, that is transparent. And for me as a designer, the challenge is that from the outset, if I can get numbers that can be flexible, so whenever the Kevin, the landscape architect, goes and changes the design, I'm not off to redo my full hydraulic analysis again. So it's getting a certain flexibility to that design. So I'll, I'll, I'll quickly run through a few of these items. Um, I'll launch straight into this. Um, and before I do, I'm just going to give you a quick anecdote, uh, which I usually bore most people with. Uh, about eight years ago now, um, I was given one of my first SUD schemes over in Scotland, and it was a commercial outfit. And uh, essentially, it was a two hectare site. Now, they had gone through planning, but there was no real drawings, so to speak. It had gone as a DMB, so minimal information. So that, for that two hectare site, we had 13,000 cubic metres of storage. So that was to be the size of the, the pond or the basin or whatever was going to facilitate the storage. The contractor said, um, can you come and have a look at this? We've won the job, but we've won it on the basis that we don't think the figures are right. Uh, so he had gone out on a limb and said, well, he had the appreciation that they weren't right. And lo and behold, uh, the person who had done the design, which was specifically focused around coming up with the volumes, had used the wrong units. So rather than 20,000 square metres for two hectares, it was 200,000 metres. Looking back at that now, the, the more concerning aspect, it's not about the, the graduate who is using the model or applying the numbers. It was the levels of evaluation that had gone through his boss, it had signed off by the director, it had been signed off by SEPA and Scottish Water, and nobody had looked at that figure and thought, how does that, how, how does that sit within the, the wider landscape? So that's where I'm coming from. Um, this scheme is it's not my scheme. It, it is one that has gone to planning, um, but it's gone to planning with a, a SUDS, and I would put probably an inverted commas scheme, a SUDS approach. And really, it's about how we fit these volumes of water and control these rates throughout the site um, and, and not go back to this idea that we use big pipes to get it to the end of the site. So really, this scheme that was proposed, uh, the large blue lines you can see coming down the, uh, across the site are two large 1,500 pipes. Uh, so that one meter in diameter, they get into 1,800, so almost two meters, and then eventually end up about, it's either 2.1 or 2.4 metres in the amber. That provides most of the storage, and you have a final flow control before it leaves the site. <coughs> that controls up to the 130. After 130, any surcharge flows that come up and out of the system are stored within a basin. So this is a, a dry basin most of the time, and will only ever be wet whenever this 130 event and above happens. So that will store up to the one in the hundred. There's other stories around the site. There's permal pavement. It's a good for stable home site. So the permal pavement's been used as a means of, of, of basically tick boxing that criteria squaring shape. So 
The surprising thing for me was that there's no storage within any of the permanent pavement. The storage is all within the basin and within the pipes. I'm not going to dwell on this. This is not what we're here for today. Um, the one thing I would point out from a matter of resilience, you know, for, for really trying to force some flood resilience, we need to look at where the pinch points, where the, where the modes of failure are. What I like to see as part of the design is that we've got multiple opportunities for failure before the whole scheme fails. On this scheme, if we get one blockage at the flow control, that storage becomes ineffective because we don't have a discharge. So I can sit full for many days and build up water that's not visible from the ground. So that mode of failure is that one blockage at that one flow control. So really, what we have in a very much simplistic, this is what I gave the wife to do a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she threw this up. Um, we, we, we have these schemes that we see coming through the door as local authorities that are catchments and they, they collect water and they convey water through the site. The pipes get bigger and bigger and we have a method of storage at the end of the site, which generally may require more land pick. So in terms of, of land value, that land, that volume needs to be placed somewhere. And we have either one or two flow controls at the end of the design. I'm not saying that's for all designs, but that, that approach is commonly applied within the industry. It doesn't deliver on a number of levels. We're not properly using that water on the surface in a way we could do. Um, we're, we're promoting the conveyance and therefore we need more cost, bigger pipes to get the water to where we want to store it. And we've got very low resilience. So that one black, that one black bag that covers that final flow control basically will, will, it, it will contravene all the calculations we do. So if we roll back to uh, concept design, if we roll back right back to a point where we just look at the site, we look at normal characteristics. This essentially explains uh, what that site's doing. We have a central high point, and it's falling away on all sides. And if you look at that, what you essentially have is two management trains. If you want to use that local catchment topography to move water around that site, that's probably the way you would do it. The water would shed down slope to the boundaries, and you would move it right the way around the site for management train one. And then because we've got a, a high point in the middle, we would take the rest of that water and get it to the final flow control point. So we've got two separate management trains. So if we, if we try to come up with these flexible figures, this is the sort of framework I've worked up over the years. I try and look at the development as development per square meter. So within each part of that site, I have got an area and I can pro rata the flow rate and the volume to be assigned with, with that area within that subcatchment. So I can start to play around with that. And I don't just do it for the one in the 100. So I'm not trying to store the one in the 100 in any particular part of the site. I might store the one-on-one -on -one and take the rest of the water and put it into the next part of the subcatchment. I'll be able to get away that at outline design will be fairly robust and it only needs a post-validation at that point. So for this example, I've only used the one-on-one -on -one and the one-on-100, -on but I could use the one-on-10, the one-on-30. So I could use a whole range of storm severities and I get a bit more intricate than that, but we could be here. I could make it quite boring by doing that. Uh, so before we, we actually start to look at getting all that water down to the end of the site, the first protocol in terms of designing is to identify the opportunity, to identify the opportunity in each part of the site as to where we can store that water. So if we take that middle part of the site, that first part of that management train, we could say, well, those two permal pavements, we could store water within the sub-base. So that would be a volume of water. We could take very small pockets, so little green areas that are generally dead space. 
So that picture you see there is from Land Grove, that's a little basin. It's no more than 300 mil deep. Uh, that can all contribute to that storage. We could have larger areas that form part of the, the wider shared space. So all of these will contribute to storage now. We're not saying we have to do them all. We're, we're, doing, we're saying we have a palette. We have a number of opportunities here, right at the start of the management train, to start providing that storage. And what I would say is, if we do it in that manner, we're doing it at very minimal cost. The cost here is about landscaping. So it's about shaping that topography to provide that storage and doing it in a manner that we feel is acceptable within that part of the development. Permal pavement will be slightly more expensive, but again, you offset that against the storage you have to provide anyway. So you could almost say it's at negative cost because you would have to provide the storage in that part of the site regardless. So we have the site, we're back to the site. Um, I haven't played around with the layout, I've just used the layout we had before. We've got, as you can see, we've got this sort of swath of green area right the way around the site, which uh, is quite opportunistic in terms of they are the low spots. And generally the low areas are the easiest place because that's generally where water will want to go. So we're working with water in this instance. Um, the first protocol is to basically identify a number of sub-catchments, so subsections of that site, and basically to, to identify how we are going to control flow and the movement of water around that site. So in this one we've got uh, one, two, three, seven sub-catchments. So six with actual house developments, and then one final one as a site control. So just to very quickly explain uh, where we're coming from this, if you look at the figures above, uh, what I've said in the first one here, and this is very sort of outline design, it almost says concept. We don't have that much space, probably. So we might say we'll only control the one in one year. So I've used half the hectare, so half a hectare, 5,000 square meters. If we apply that ratio to our flow control, 3.6 multiplied by 0.5 gives us 1.8. That's how we're controlling the flow. We know for the one year we're going to be storing 15 mil of water. So for each square meter of each square meter of hard surface, we have to store 15 mil. So I've used that 15 mil and multiplied it by my hard impermeable area. So that 0.25 of a hectare is the impermeable area, and then multiplied that by the storage per square meter, and I've come up with a storage volume of in around about 40 cubic meters. And I'm going to apply that and allocate that 40 cubic meters to that subcatchment. I'll take it to the next bit. So I've controlled the one year. Everything in excess of the one year flow is going to go on to the next part of the system. I've taken that, and again, I don't have that much space, so again, I've, I've used the one year control. I've already stored the first subcatchment, so I don't need to restore that. So I've got another 40 cubic meters. I move into the third subcatchment, and at that point we've got this large corner that's all in the flat. So what we could say is we could have a large linear wetland, or we could have a large dry basin, or some sort of feature that will give us extra storage. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying we're going to control for the 1 in 100 plus climate change. So we've got the flow rates allocated for that, so that's storing everything that's generated up to the 1 in 100 year within that subcatch, within that small parcel of area, it's going to deal with its own runoff. So it's going to deal with all the runoff that's generated within that subcatchment, and it's going to take the additional runoff from upstream. So the, the, the excess flow, the exceedance flow from upstream, that will cascade down the network. We're actually going to put a barrier at that point and store it at that point. So what, what we can say is, essentially we've stored the 100 year for that part of the management train at that point. We can do the same right the way down. So essentially the same manner. And if we then come on to the, the next part, it's pretty much a mirror image, so we don't have that much potential storage. So what we're saying here is, well, we'll, we'll control back to one one year, and we'll take the residual into our site control. So the site control here is essentially the one in 100 
sorry, the site control is long-term storage plus the lake seedings from upstream, which is only really the bit from our last subcatchment. So we're able to provide all of that on the surface. And we're doing that within a controlled manner. The important thing to me here is, rather than just one blockage, if one of the controls gets a blockage or is exceeded, we have infinite points where we can provide that capacity back. So the system doesn't fail catastrophically. It fails incrementally. And from a flood resilience point of view, I feel that's quite important. So um, it took a lot longer doing that than I should have. Um, there's five minutes to the rest. Um, hopefully, everybody in the room knows about betterment at 50%. It's been what's been advocated over the last 10 years, or at least well, last since 2007. I think it's the first time I spotted it in the, the, the London SPG. I, I'm, I'm questioning: Has anybody ever questioned why? Why is it 50%? Is it a nice round figure? And more importantly, what 50%? Generally speaking, it's prescribed as taking the, the peak rate of runoff from a site and reducing that by 50%. And what I would suggest, and I'll, I'll try and demonstrate that within the next few slides, is that 50% we should really be looking for is the bit right at the start of the hydrograph. So we can have greatest impact right through it, all of the return periods, not just the peak one, not just the 100 year, but in the one on one, in the one on ten, in the one on thirty, the ones that really are critical in inner urban areas where we have CSO spill and where we have flooding. So that's the quote, that's the current one, that's 2014. It's no longer mandatory, it, it doesn't prescribe it as being mandatory, but the sort of, it's almost as if they're inferring that why can't you do it? Because everybody else at this point is delivering 50% betterment, so therefore it's the minimum recognised deliverable. So if we take a, a site area that's, say, a hectare in size, generally speaking, it ranges between 150 to 200. So that scale bar on the left-hand side, that outflow rate, we reduce that by 50%. So we bring, bring it from 75%, sorry, 150 litres per second per hectare, down to 75. So we're reducing by 50%. If we then analyse that, and this is because we're in statistics today. Um, I thought better get a few graphs in and a few stats. If we look at that, that dashed line is the outflow. That's how the flows are controlled, leaving the site. The pink shaded area is how the volume is operating, how the volume of water that's being controlled is stored within the site. So you can see this. it's stored and you get about 300 cubic metres. So for that site, if you're controlling to green feed runoff, you would get 6,800 cubic metres. Because we're doing 50%, it's about 300, so it's about 290 for this situation. However, to ask the question, why are we doing it? Belfast, last Thursday, it wasn't a 100 year storm that we had. I haven't done the analysis, but it was much less than that. Combined sewer overflows, again, these aren't things that spill in the one in a hundred year event. They spill much more frequently and they will generally be in around the one in one, one in two year. So what I would say is what we are trying to do is, is control it in a different manner. So in the previous example, in the previous example, we have this flow arrangement where we control flows, we control to quite a large rate, 50 litres or 75 litres per second per hectare is quite a large rate. And what we're doing is we're downsizing that to greenfield runoff. So the volume hasn't changed. It's just the manner in which we control. So the volume becomes arbitrary. We have a volume that we store. It could have been 100 cubic metres, could have been 200, could have been 300. The volume becomes arbitrary and we store to greenfield runoff rate. So in effect we have this, we have, and whatever is in exceedance, that is uncontrolled, that goes into the system. So we, we, we will get up to return period, but at the lower range of return periods we should get much better control. So how does that look? Well essentially the, the pink line is what you saw before, the pink and red, that's the 50% the betterment, how it's generally prescribed and utilised. The blue shaded area is essentially if you control Greenfield runoff rates using the same volume. 
This is for the one in 100. What you will see here is much longer retention times. Because we're controlling the outflow rate to a much smaller outflow, outflow we have much longer retention times within the system. So the important aspect for me here is if we are letting all the water back into the system within a couple of hours, most likely that system will still be under stress. CSOs may still be spilling, the flooding, the surface water ponding, everything else will still be in the system. So we want to hold that water within the system for much longer. That additional spill flow in this situation, what we're getting here is that exceedance flow is about the same rate in total as the controlled rate. So that's the uncontrolled, which is about the same rate in that situation. If you look at a smaller return period, the one in 10, we have a similar setup. We have rain fade control rate. And what you're saying here is we're getting better utilization because the storage is still our 300 cubic meters. That's what we have in storage. And we're getting better utilization, both in terms of time of retention and actual storage utilization. So that's the capacity that's used and the time of retention. So you can see that additional storage has been utilized and also the time of retention. Sorry, I can't really see that, but um, essentially, the questions we have to ask is why we're doing it. And uh, essentially, we need to ask, in catchments, what actually triggers rainfall to cause flooding? <coughs> what, what rainfall triggers CSO spill? And it's generally less than one in 100. In most urban situations, the, the one that's really critical is the one in 10. And therefore, we need to look at that retention time. And not necessarily we, we're looking at critical duration. We're looking at critical duration of the catchment rather than the storage feature. So just to wind up, um, numbers should, the, the calculations and the numbers shouldn't be something that's impenetrable to all but the person who can use the the software or the equations to work out what the, the, the numbers are. This should be something that is accessible and easy to evaluate and easy to apply. I feel that doing it in a different manner allows opportunity for both value engineering in terms of you get better, more cost effective systems and they provide wider benefits in doing that, both in terms of flood resilience, in terms of quality, because of retention times, in terms of biodiversity, so across the full spectrum. In terms of retrofit, doing suds and controlling that flow can add benefit, but only if you ask the right questions. You need to ask how you're controlling that flow, because if you let the water out within one or two hours, the system that's going into may likely still be under stress. So it can, but only if it's done the right way. So we need to ask the right questions. So I'll finish off by asking a question. We need to ask the right questions. Um, and by asking those questions, we will then define how we control those flows. And it may not be the same for all parts of the system, because different parts of that catchment and that system may operate differently. And thank you for listening. Hi, Lee Parrott. Is it on? A Marcy consultant. So I've struggled to hear quite a lot of the two speakers at the back here, but um, so apologies if, if he did mention this. Really interested in your, say, your first example about the cascading system going around the site. Yes. Um, first thing that comes into my mind, and I wonder if you can comment at all on, on, on say, adoption of such a system when we're talking about cascading systems with different kind of different return periods being applied throughout. And do you find that a cascading system like that still ends up with a significantly smaller end basin or, or not? Um, I think the, the volumes should be generally equal in terms of you can do it within the final basin or the final pond, or you can distribute that storage volume right across the site. What I did in that example was distribute across the site so by the time I got to the end, the big volume that was contained within the underground pipe storage was no longer required because I had redistributed that. <coughs> so if we, if we thought about it in an hour way, if we took it all to a final basin, that basin would be infinitely different because we already have dealt with most of the storage right across the site.
So in a, in a context, the storage volumes are the same. We're just distributing them across the site, so we're doing it in a different manner. So we're holding water in parcels and, and little subsections right across the site. Same volume, but used in different places. You might want to have a chat with me afterwards. I've got a very puzzled looking face, I know, because if you're still then taking it through the same system, I find in doing that kind of design, you end up still not, ha you have a proportionately still fairly large end basin or, or storage, um, because obviously it is making its way and cascading round, and the, and the time it takes to do that is sometimes quicker than it is for the eventual outfall from the site to get rid of all the water. So you still end up vol with a, a still, say, more storage volume in total than you would if you had one cis storage system. I think um, where we probably differ in opinion here is my methodology or my approach would be that we, if you store right across the site, that storage volume doesn't, that, that volume doesn't make its way to the end of the site. So you don't have to deal with it. You've already dealt with it up the site. Whereas in your example, you're taking the water right to the end of the site. So you have to deal with it in that one location. And therefore, it's a, a different distribution. I know it's still puzzled faces. <laughs> it takes a while for the penny to drop me. It took me a while to work out that process of six months. So 20 minutes is, uh, is fast track. Can I ask that? What's doing is that you're controlling the runoff through each part of the a greenfield runoff rate, isn't it? Yeah. And that's the critical part. That's why you're able to take the volume away from that final basin, because from, from each of your upper catchment areas, you're controlling a greenfield runoff rate. Yeah, Is that correct? Uh, that's exactly it. It's, it's in very basic terms. Can we include that? Hi, Owen Hayes from Golder Associates. It was just a follow-on to that. You know when you are breaking it out in subcatchments, those, those very small uh, greenfield runoff rates are quite difficult to control, so you're facing failure at those control points a lot more often, you'd think, or, or do you have it's thoughts very, on that? Um, I think it's a, an excellent question. I think it's one that really should be answered by the industry as a whole. This idea that you can only control to a minimum of five liters per second, really uh, what that's saying is that the, the control point is unprotected, i.e. there's a high probability of, of blockage, and that's really what it's about. If we design protected flow control structures, <coughs> our flow controls generally get down to about 20 mil in diameter, and that's much smaller than the, the 100 mil that's generally prescribed for the, that five or second. But that's really about how we protect that from blockage. We want minimal maintenance. So it shouldn't be any more maintenance than, it should be less maintenance than the, the other system.